My name is Kevin McCann. Um, I'm an ecologist in the Department of Integrative Biology. So where I'm going to take off is actually follows right from that. He just was talking about plant communication. Basically, I'm going to step back and talk about how nature's connectivity impacts sustainability. Okay? And my title of the talk, Ecological Entanglement, Spooky Action at a Distance, and it kind of gives you the punchline right there. Basically, I stole this from physicists. Okay, physicists just, I just was reading an article in the paper uh, the last week, and there's this thing called quantum entanglement. Quantum entanglement is this notion where two particles separated by vast distances still sort of speak to each other. An action on one yields an action on another, much like the plants. What we're going to see today is uh, um, that this, in fact, happens in ecological systems as well. Einstein called that spooky action at a distance because it was this mysterious connection. What I'm going to argue is that, in fact, in ecological systems, when we're trying to understand agricultural sustainability, there is indeed this exact same thing happening. We have sort of, we do things on the field, and then we have spooky actions way away in a far off ecosystem. And if we're truly going to understand agricultural sustainability, we need to kind of wrestle with this. And the answer is going to be that it's all through connections that we actually understand. And I'm going to give you one example um, that you're all familiar with, but I want, to, I want to emphasize there's many types of examples where we have this sort of local actions. Uh, farm, we, we do something on a farm, for example, add fertilizer, and we have spook, spooky distant actions elsewhere. So what we have here is Lake Erie 2011. That sort of pea green water is an example of ecosystem imbalance, okay? And it's a costly ecosystem imbalance. Algae is grown to an enormous density. Whenever anything in an ecosystem grows to enormous density, that's sort of the hallmark of ecological imbalance, okay? So two things happen that's costly here. One, often toxins, a lot of these algae that grow and flourish, end up being toxic, and so they poison our water, okay? A second thing happens that's also sort of part of the connectivity of an ecosystem. This algae flourishes, it grows, and eventually it senesces. As it senesces, it settles to the bottom of the lake. At the bottom of the lake, there actually is very little air and wind mixing, so it's already not super uh, high in oxygen. Bacteria, doing the, its thing it's supposed to do, colonizes the dead algae. So while we see all this green up top, there's sort of brown system down, way down on the bottom, with bacteria taking off. The bacteria consumes oxygen. Okay, and therefore leaves behind a massive dead zone. It consumes so much oxygen that virtually there's none left. In this case, 2011, I think it was 3,800 square kilometers of dead zone in algae. Okay, so the cost to both water quality but also fisheries is enormous. So what's the spooky action at a distance? Well, this is an agricultural issue, and it's a fundamental one. And we're going to kind of back off and take a look at it here. But basically what happens is if we follow a bit of fertilizer somewhere on this cartoon landscape, say hundreds of kilometers away from Lake Erie, some of that fertilizer doesn't get used. Okay, So the fertilizer move, uh, through rain gets pushed into nature's transport system, which are the streams and rivers. Okay, and there that fertilizer moves through, sometimes we'll go through certain biotic cycles, but eventually in some form we'll move through streams and rivers and end up in the ultimate receptacle, Lake Erie, potentially hundreds of kilometers away. Okay, and that's the spooky action at a distance. Locally put on fertilizer, nature through its connectivity moves it through the landscape and it lands in Lake Erie where the previous slide um, Un unfolds because of that. Basically what's happening is unused fertilizer finally does its job, but it's doing its job in the wrong place, right? It's doing it in the lake. Okay, so the next thing I kind of wanted to sort of say, so that's right in our backyard, but the, the issue is, is this happening in a lot of places? What's, what's going on globally? So what this is, the 2018 science paper here, and all the sort of red, pink shading show you zones that, uh, of oxygen, massive oxygen depletion. And the, the largest finger being pointed here is really is at agriculture. There's also a finger being pointed at climate change. All right? And so basically this article and a few other articles have argued since the 50s, um, it's the number of dead zones globally is quadrupled. And most of that is due to agriculture. All right? And on the right-hand side, I'm just showing you an example of a pristine coral reef. And below it, what people now call microbialized ecosystems in the ocean. And why do they call them microbialized? It's the same issue as in Lake Erie, where you have microbes take over, and a lot of the diversity is sort of taken away. 
So I've kind of basically raised this issue to sort of show that one of the things that we here at the University of Guelph are trying to do is why clearly we need to feed a growing planet. But what we're arguing here is that this is one of the fundamental uh, environmental sustainability issues that agriculture has to wrestle with. Okay? And I want to end on a positive note. One interesting aspect of connectivity is that in the same sense that bad local actions or not properly managed local actions precipitate regional imbalance and even global imbalance, it also sort of means that if you act local, you're in a sense acting regionally and acting globally. So you can reverse it and sort of say, we do the right thing locally, it will move through nature's con uh, connected networks to actually yield, uh, you know, balanced ecosystem sustainable environmental conditions. So I think we basically what's arguing is there's a solution to this. I want to end by making a plug for 25 plus researchers, the researchers at the University of Guelph that are a team of scientists that span up from right on the field to whole eco bio geochemical cycles like Dr. Merrick Turetsky. Um, and we're working on a common problem, just like physicists worked on common problems way back when. This is a significant com common problem. And we kind of, as a team, are coming together to kind of try to, to, to actually take a, a, you know, a stab at so solving this. Hopefully in about five years, we'll have a comeback and we'll be able to say some real positive things about this. Thank you. <laughs>